Okay, uh, resuming the programming. Um, <laughs> most of the challenges that we are facing today with the possible exception of digital technology are systems challenges. And in order to solve them, we need to consider system solutions and make sure that these are equally complex. Also reflecting, while scientific research is critical to understanding the environment and crafting solutions, in order to be effective and impactful, the scientific community must work with governments, NGOs, the private sector, and everyday citizens in their approaches. Before we tuned in this morning, I was inspired by the cover of National Geographic magazine. Recognizing the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, it asked whether in 2070, we would look back and ask whether we had destroyed or whether we have saved the planet. This segues nicely into the second panel's charge. Even as we work to address today's environmental challenges, we must anticipate the hurdles ahead. What are the problems that will mark the next 50 years of celebrating Earth Day? This is not just a matter of understanding what will shape our environment, but how we are preparing ourselves or need to prepare ourselves on a global scale through technology, policy, and action. Our first panelist is Aaron Salzberg, the director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina, established to advance a more water secure world through scientific research, technical innovation, and policy reform and advocacy. Before joining UNC, Aaron managed the development and implementation of US foreign policy on drinking water and sanitation, water resource management, and transboundary water at the US Department of State. From 2010 to 2017, Aaron served as the State Department's Special Coordinator for Water Resources, the first expert to serve in this role. Second, we have Aidan Dion, Vice President with IBM's Corporate Environmental Affairs staff. She leads a team that is charged with defining IBM's strategy, establishing and maintaining its global environmental management system, and setting requirements and goals for environmental, energy, and chemical management. She and her team advise and are responsible for driving environmental leadership performance across IBM's business operations, including research, product, manufacturing, real estate management, procurement, logistics, services, and solutions. She also encourages IBM to collaborate with the global environmental policy community including UN Environment. Dr. David Klein is a staff scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. David grew up in Southern California and received his PhD from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where he remained as a research biologist from 2011 through 2019. David is a coral reef ecologist who studies the fate of coral reefs in a rapidly changing world. He studies the ecology of corals and reef communities and how reefs will change under the plethora of stresses they face, both local, including pollution and disease, and global, warming and ocean acidification. He regularly collaborates with engineers, computer scientists, chemists, and physiologists in developing new and innovative conservation technologies. Before I ask David Klein to begin, I'd like to note to any viewers who are just tuning in or anyone who's been with us since the beginning, please submit your questions to stip, S-T-I-P, at wilsoncenter.org or tag stip on Twitter using the handle at Wilson Stip. This will allow us to share your questions with the panelists after their speeches. David, please begin. Good morning, everybody. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, thank you, Anne, for that introduction. And I just wanted, um, to give a little introduction to my work on coral reefs and how I've been trying to use new technologies to help um, save coral reefs in an era of rapid climate change. So as you're all probably aware, coral reefs are incredibly important ecosystems. There are over 500 million coastal, community, uh, coastal people around the world that are dependent on coral reefs for their incomes and livelihoods. They're like the rainforest of the ocean and that they host over 25% of the marine biodiversity. And economically, they're incredibly important, providing billions of dollars every year from tourism and fisheries. And they also protect the land um, from wave energy and storms. So they serve all these incredibly important functions 
while only covering about 1% of the earth. And as you're all probably aware, these incredibly beautiful ecosystems are under threat and they're being lost at an unprecedented rate. Some people even believe that coral reefs as we know them could be gone by as early as 2050. This is due to um, global stressors related to climate change, including warming and ocean acidification, but also lo local stresses like pollution, overfishing, um, and, and, and poor um, management of development. And I would argue that we need to use the latest science and technology to find new and innovative ways to protect coral reefs and to provide time so that we can deal with the underlying challenge of climate change. And these um, technologies include new imaging technologies so we can uh, image coral reefs faster and at greater scales. Um, this includes using advances in underwater robots, including AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles. So we've been collaborating with a group in Sydney to do um, large multi-kilometer uh, 3D surveys of coral reefs, and we're working with these groups as they develop ways to have swarms of these underwater robots that eventually will be able to serve, uh, survey all of the world's reefs um, in the matter of months and, and um, potentially providing really um, important data at, at a much greater scale, a global scale, uh, really quickly. But associated with this advance in imaging and robotics, um, this generates millions of images, and the, there's no way we could use the traditional method of getting data from imagery, of uh, having a horde of students sit on their computers and try to get annotate what's under um, every pixel on an image, which can take years to actually get data from imagery. So we've had a project um, when I was at UCSD at Scripps using machine learning to speed up that process. And this project was called the Computer Vision and Coral Ecology Project. We have developed a, a website called CoralNet that's now used by 500 coral reef groups all around the world and is the main um, analysis system that NOAA uses for all their coral reef surveys. And by using machine learning or AI, much like is used on Facebook to automatically recognize your friend's faces, the computer can recognize different species of corals, um, seaweeds and the, the main invertebrates on coral reefs, they could do it 10,000 time, times faster than coral reef ecologists at over 90% accuracy. So we've been working on this um, along with many groups around the world, and this is becoming a reality that we can, we can actually get data from imagery much faster at the scale that's needed um, for conservation and management. But unfortunately, considering how much damage has been done to coral reefs, even in just the last decade. So in um, 2000, 2016 to 2019 was the third global bleaching event where up to 40 to 50% of the world's reefs bleached. And there was so much damage done by this massive bleaching event that coral reef scientists as a community had to decide that they had to take a more activist approach. They had to try to find ways to actually restore these damaged reefs and not wait for um, climate change to improve, basically try to do something right away. So there's efforts all around the world to find ways to farm corals and then to plant them back on the reef to build hopefully highly functional coral reef ecosystems. Um, and in my research, we're trying to make sure that this restoration is informed by the best possible science. This includes methods that have been developed for studying cancer in humans. Um, so I've been collaborating with cellular physiologists such as Martin Trescaris at Scripps to use cellular physiology tools to understand how corals deal with environmental stress at the cellular level. So this is an image of coral cells and we can actually image how different enzymes are used when corals are exposed to different types of stress like temperature, pH and oxygen. And by using these methods, we hope to be able to develop um, basically strategies for protecting corals and use the most resilient and tough corals for restoration efforts. Another um, technology approach that I've been working on for many years um, is I build underwater time machines. And these are basically 
um, systems where I can simulate future environmental conditions, so future levels of temperature, pH, and oxygen, create these future scenarios, and see how corals and all the key organisms in the ecosystem will be impacted. This gives us um, some really important insight into how coral reef ecosystems will be uh, impacted by climate change. And we're beginning to collaborate with coral restoration groups to try to use this system to find the toughest possible corals, to find the true super corals out there that can be used in the restoration efforts and that will best survive the changes to the environment that will occur in the next 10 to 50 years. And I would argue that we need these combination of approaches to really try to buy us more time so we can build, so that we can deal with the real elephant in the room, which is climate change, which definitely lowering CO2 emissions is the big challenge. But by using technology, we can ensure that we will have healthy coral reefs. And hopefully by the time that CO2 levels in the atmospheres go down, that we still have healthy coral reefs all around the world. And with that, um, thank you very much for your time. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that the underwater time machines came up and I will absolutely be asking you a bit more about that later on. But I have an initial question before we moved on. The available, availability of satellite imagery and Earth observations also through drones and other technologies was a theme that was raised on the earlier panel. And you discussed using different machine learning approaches for pixel annotation to let us take advantage of that information. I'm wondering, are those sorts of approaches sufficient to unlocking the data in Earth observations and making it actionable? And also, even when we have so much information coming in from satellite data, is this enough to understand the issues that you're studying? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, Thanks to Silicon Valley and companies such as Facebook and Google, there's so much money going into AI and IBM. There's so much money going to AI that it's developing incredibly rapidly. It seems like every year, what would take 10 years in other scientific fields is happening in one year. And I feel like as machine learning improves, it gets better and better. And I think um, satellite imagery, drones, um, plane imagery, uh, imagery from airplanes, this is all part of the solution and I think we needed a, a nested approach. Those underwater robots that I was talking about basically are like underwater drones. So we need high resolution underwater images, drones, airplanes, and satellites. And by putting these different la layers of data together and using machine learning, I think that will give us the resolution and the scale, a true global scale, to really be able to address this massive problem at the speed that's needed for conservation and management. Thank you um, for that reflection. And just one probing follow-up question because it's right there. Do you see the investments that Facebook, Google, and others are making in artificial intelligence trickling down to benefit the environmental community and also helping your work on coral reefs? Um, at, as I mentioned, the investment speeds up the computer science is, and it is incredibly important, but there's also a number of foundations that come out of these groups. My underwater time machines, which I guess we'll talk about later, um, they've been funded recently by the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners. So Eric and Wendy Schmidt of Google um, actually have several foundations and they support a lot of the um, base science that's necessary to do these questions. And a lot of times they support the riskier approaches that can't be supported by traditional funding agencies such as the NSF. So I think they serve a really important role. And um, a, a lot of that is through philanthropy, through private foundations. Thank you for making that point. I think a lot about the role that different um, parties can play in institutionalizing these approaches as well as getting them started. And I think that the foundation landscape and the private sector is excellent at innovating quickly and investing in cutting edge research and developments that can be taken up and scaled later on. So with that, thanks again for your intervention. I 
will get back to those underwater time machines, but before I do, I'd like to hand it over to Idan for her initial thoughts on the topic. Okay, I hope I unmuted myself and thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you, David, for a uh, very informative introduction, and uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this panel. So, uh, excellent points that Anne made about collaboration, science, and so on. So let me just share a couple of examples of what we are doing to underscore the importance of those areas. Um, so let me start by saying that there's absolutely a need, in my view, to drive up the demand of um, technology so that we could really direct our our know-how, our capability to help the environment. You know, in other industries that we serve, there is uh, incredible recognition of what AI, you know, IoT, all this technology could be brought to bear. And, and these industries demand that. And I think one of the things we need to do is to cause this technology to be demanded and to be delivered. Uh, in, a speed, in a speed that is much faster, as David mentioned, than what we're doing today. And we have a part in companies and so on. Uh, and a couple of examples in collaboration uh, I'd like to share is, you know, as a, as a founding member of UNEP's Science Policy and Business Forum uh, for the Environment, IBM has been promoting this very idea of how do we bring parties together from companies to governments to private citizens to foundations uh, like the Wilson Centers to come together and create uh, this need. And, uh, as, and I also believe that they're, they're, we need to work together to showcase what can be done. And, and actually in doing so, it lays bare what needs to be done and how we need to run a lot faster. So one of the things we're doing is to help UN create a, uh, a digital platform to deal with marine litter. Okay, and as a very first step, as we speak, our technologists are in the process of creating a prototype to show how we will be, how using AI, natural language processing, we will be able to help make the vast quantities of data that, that is in the possession of UN and other government agencies to make them available to, to scientists, to policymakers, to even citizens, right? So, so we are creating that and using a natural language interface to make the access of data much more easier. So like I said, that's a prototype that we're working on as we speak. And we would like, we, would, we, we target to make that available in June. But more importantly behind it, the center's vision is to, in my view, to, is to organize many, many good information out there. And so that it's, 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 could be access beyond just scientists who knows UN or who knows NASA or who knows other government agencies. We want to help organize the content, right? Collate that and make it and curate it. And, and so that any person could walk up there using a very simple interface to access it. So that's, that's one uh, collaboration that we're doing with UN. And I think showing is very important showing the art of possible, right? What, what, what can be done. And the second example I wanted to quickly uh, share is what IBM has been doing over the last seven years uh, in partnership with RPI. This is uh, Russell Mayer Polytechnic Institute and a nonprofit organization known as FUND, F-U-N-D in upstate New York uh, to understand uh, Lake George and to develop a blueprint to help regulators and citizens and nonprofits and everyone, uh, communities, uh, either revitalize or preserve uh, fresh water bodies. So in this particular case, uh, and, and the key thing here really is, is the partnership. You know, how do we make it work? How do we propel uh, how do we share experience? How do we make uh, this, you know, collaboration last? Not just one lake, not just one place, not just seven years, but hopefully for a long time. So Lake George is a pristine lake. 
uh, in upstate New York is about 32 miles long and the widest part is only three miles and there's only one outlet heading north to Lake Champlain in Vermont. And it's been studied for over 30 years by FUN. FUN is an advocacy nonprofit organization. Its mission is to protect this lake. 30 years, the FUN has been working with RPI, uh, understanding the lake and has a lot of good information, publications and so on. In 2013, about the time they were going to publish a 30 years worth of study, they uncover significant new stressors, particularly salt, raw salt, invasive species and uh, excess nutrient in the lake. So they decided, they did, they decided that, wow, after 30 years, we need new partnership. We need more understanding about the lake. And that's where the partnership extended to include IBM. And I want to just interject a little bit about how do we all come together and RPI, IBM and FUN, uh, three of this organization, either directly or indirectly has had a long relationship. And I think that helps. I mean, we don't, although we don't have the luxury everywhere that, that does help. And another important thing is these three partners recognize they each could bring unique, uh, unique capabilities, right? Fun, as I mentioned, is an advocacy, advocacy organization. Uh, a lot of know-how they know, and they have a deep commitment to uh, preserve natural, natural resources. RPA obviously is a uh, you know, leading technology, uh, technological institute. And, 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 and has tremendous scientific uh, robotics, biological and sensing capability, where IBM brings to bear technology, cyber infrastructure, sensor monitoring, uh, weather technology. So it really helped to bring these three organizations together. So in seven years, we have implemented localized uh, weather station. We have, we're able to monitor the lake multidimensionally, depth, as well as width, and uh, we're able to monitor chemistry, biological uh, uh, parameters, and importantly, we have developed models to help us validate what we thought we knew, take the data, and, uh, and uh, continually improve our understanding. So, so today, you know, the lake is uh, very well instrumented and uh, it's, I think it's, it's called the best, uh, the most, uh, sen most monitored uh, lake in the world. And, um, and to, we have so far helped uh, identify three important findings in terms of raw salt, for example. Uh, we've learned that uh, concent high concentration of salt uh, turns, stunts the, the development of uh, frogs, you know, uh, tadpoles and actually changes the sex of tadpoles from female to male when the concentration goes up. And those are important understandings until we have uh, this additional monitoring and data we didn't know that. In terms of invasive spe species, particularly uh, mussels, we are helping to understand why. What is causing uh, these species to propagate? What conditions are favorable to the, their propagation and migration? And lastly, in terms of excessive nutrients, we learned that you cannot just monitor one depth in the lake. You have to be monitoring multiple depths. And I think that kind of underscores what many of the things David mentioned. You know, this is just one lake, but I think the same is through our ecosystem. So I, um, so, so clearly technology has much to offer. We need to bring that to bear in a speed that's much faster than what we're doing. And, and, and lastly, I also want to say that uh, partnership across the world has to expand and continue you know public government private non nonprofits scientific communities and particularly when we deal with a, sh a sheer environment you know environment is this mother nature we must respect right at the same time it's like it's our commons nobody owns it who's going to bring who's going to make the policy so that we can all act to protect that and uh so in closing we are prepare and re we recognize our own responsibility and ability to bring good tech to, to do better things quickly. So Anne, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I, I appreciated your link back to David's perspective on ecosystems. 
when I think about the next 50 years, two things that really jump out at me as critical for shaping our approaches is the system perspective, which begins with considering ecosystems as opposed to smaller pieces of the environment or variables in isolation. And then the second is innovative technologies and sources of data. So I asked David a very pointed question about Facebook and Google and whether these private sector approaches will trickle down. I would actually flip that for you. I, I know that we've worked together on the Science Policy Business Forum for the Environment, which brings together the UN, the academic community, different governments, and the private sector. And I also appreciated hearing your experience on Lake George and partnerships with foundations and local communities. From your perspective, do your partners have the capacity that they need to take advantage of new technologies and data sources? And if not, how can we help get there? Sorry, it seems to take a little while to unmute. Uh, that's a very good question, Anne. Actually, in our experience has been, many of these efforts actually started very small. And not many organizations actually has the ability to fund, to fund things like this. And I, I have been involved in many collaborations in my entire career. I, this is my career environment. Um, I would say two things. One, uh, hard work takes time, an awful lot of time. You know, this prototype that we're building, it takes many, many hours. You know, we have a short schedule, but people are working very hard. I mean, just to, or it's, and, and many things are not sexy. Organize vast quantity of data. It's not a sexy work. It's like you know, back door in a kit in the kitchen. You know, in, you, you deal with that. So so it is not easy. It takes, uh, it takes, really commitment. The other thing is uh, funding. We see ourselves uh, starting seeding a lot of projects, doing things that is initially pro bono, right? With organizations, but really to scale. That goes back to my initial comment about we need to generate demand. I mean, there are, there, there's plenty of money out there. There's no question about that. So the key here is to, instead of directing money to something, quite frankly, less important, right? We, what do, rather than the next gadget, the next, you know, app, how, how, how do we, what do we need to do to direct that lots and lots of money out there toward helping our ecosystem? That really has been a huge challenge. I think there's only so much a foundation however generous this foundation may be, uh, can do or a company could do through pro bono work. Uh, I want to come back to the fundamental uh, need for us to collectively understand what is most important and drive that demand and to incent behavior and to incent investment. Uh, you know, I think we've said it all the time in our financial sector clients, they don't need us to convince them. <laughs> they know they want to compete. They want to have the best tools out there. And I dream for the day for all of us to say, I'd like to put environment as the top client. How do we speak for the environment, right? And uh, now Mother Nature doesn't need us to speaking for her. I've always said we need to be respectful of Mother Nature. <laughs> it is us who don't hear. And how do we make all of us hear that? And I hope I answered your question, Anne. Uh, but that is kind of like the conundrum, uh, so to speak. That was great. Thank you so much. I agree about driving demand. I think it can come from the bottom up and from the top down. And also thank you for highlighting the need to think about frameworks and zoom out a little bit. And with this, I think we, we have a great segue into the third panelist who is also an expert in bringing communities together and building collaboration. So Aaron, please share your experiences. There we go. Can, can you hear me, Ann? Oh, great. Thank you. I, I think after seeing David's slides, we all want to change our jobs and do what David does. So, um, but, but I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, and thank you so much. And thanks to the Georgia Wilson Center for making this happen. I think like many of you were very busy these days at the Water Institute at UNC focused on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and actions that we can take to control the spread of COVID-19. Yeah, I think it really goes without saying, but it's times like this when we really begin to appreciate the importance of having access to safe drinking water 
to sanitation services and proper waste management, and to the basic ingredients that ensure you know sound hygiene at home, at work, healthcare facilities, wherever we are. Um, you know, this really brings all these issues really to the forefront. So I appreciate the opportunity to sit here on Earth Day and talk a little bit about the challenges that we face around water as we look forward perhaps to the next 50 years. Um, there are many, but, but what I'll do is try and focus on, on four. Uh, the first is achieving universal access to safe drinking water and sanitation services. And I think uh, many of us know this, many people across the world, in, including uh, marginalized communities here in the United States and develop, uh, develop other developed countries will continue to struggle to provide water that's safe to drink, that's accessible, especially to more vulnerable populations, that is affordable for everyone and is sustainable. Uh, what history tells us is that there's a real challenge in moving communities from first-time access all the way to safely managed services that are financially and physically sustainable. Uh, what we know is that if our goal is to is disease reduction, community water points alone won't do it. We need to move towards on-plot pipe service delivery for everyone. And this is going to be incredibly hard to do, especially for rural communities in developing countries. Uh, and because of this, I actually fear there's going to be a lot of disappointments along the way as we go forward in the next 50 years. Um, I think we need to keep our eyes on the prize, which is progressively improving the level of service for everyone every day working to move everyone one rung up the ladder and closer to safety managed services. And I think that's where we're going to make the most progress. Um, there's another problem around drinking water that I want to highlight. Uh, last year, we passed a new threshold. The Chemical Abstract Service Register is 150 millionth unique chemical substance. Uh, today, there are over 100,000 chemicals being produced at significant levels. Many of these chemicals from industry, agriculture, community, uh, sorry, consumer waste uh, will likely find their way into our water supply and become an increasing threat to human and environmental health. Uh, many of these are already in our water. Uh, we only test for a few and we regulate even fewer. Uh, you know, per Per and per fluoral alkyl substances are a good example of some of the emerging risks, I think, that lie ahead for us. We're working hard to develop new technologies to detect and address some of these risks, but we're playing catch up. Uh, but we're likely to see a growing number of places where the health risks from chemical contaminants may soon pass uh, those from microbial contamination. And this is going to be especially true for the environment and the impacts that we see there. So this leads to my next challenge. Uh, wastewater management. I think uh, probably everybody on our webcast knows the statistics here. 80% of the world's wastewater gets dumped back into the environment without any form of treatment. We could talk all day, I think, about the, the impacts that this has on human health, on the environment, on the economies. Uh, to be clear, ending open defecation won't solve this problem. Storing waste on site won't solve this problem. We actually need to move towards near universal treatment of all wastewater to keep biological and chemical pollutants out of our water systems, out of our groundwater, out of our surface water, and out of our environment. And so that's the solution we need to work for, and technology is really going to have to drive uh, some innovations here to make that happen. If not, you know, our surface and groundwater supplies are going to become increasingly degraded. And, and, and this segues into our third challenge, which is water security. And, and, and simply put, we have another number of communities, cities, provinces, countries, that will be unable to bring demand in line with renewable available supplies. They will fundamentally lack the water that they need to meet human, economic, and environmental needs. Now, population growth, urbanization, overextraction of groundwater, degraded supplies, climate change will drive many of these types of challenges. Um, but to achieve water security, uh, countries will need to protect their existing resources, they'll need to reduce consumption, particularly for agriculture. They'll need to augment supplies through desalinization, but also wastewater reuse. And we need to put in place and enforce a regulatory and policy framework that really incentivizes, you know, either I'm talking a little bit about this, incentivizes the sound management of water resources and builds resiliencies to floods, droughts, and other water-related disasters. And hopefully we can come back and talk a little bit about some of those incentives and what that might look like. Um, I'm going to make a plug for operational hydrology here. I know people don't like that. Many people don't even know what it is and don't talk about it. But look, um, to make sound decisions, we need the tools to measure, model, and predict the state of our water resources 
across both, both spatial and temporal scales. David talked about some of the work he's trying to do to do this in, in coral reefs. Look, without good data, we literally are flying blind. Uh, yet, as international donors, the United States, many others, we do very little to build the operational capacity of the National Hydrometeorological Services providers throughout the world. And so we're not giving them the tools that they need to make good decisions. Uh, look, we need to know the quality and the quantity of the water we have. We need to know how these characteristics will change in real time to provide people with the knowledge that they're going to need to manage water wisely and to protect lives and livelihoods. Um, this leads to my last challenge, and perhaps maybe the hardest. The institutionalization of cooperative planning, development, and management. Um, I, I think if we're going to get the most out of the water we have, we're going to have to work smarter. Uh, good data is part of that. Capital mobilization is part of it. Technology development, capacity building, all part of that. But at the end of the day, it's about how do you make sound decisions that optimize the benefits of water use across competing uses for all stakeholders, including marginalized communities and the environment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of names for this in the water world. Um, integrated water resources management, the nexus approach, basin-wide planning, sustainable development, transboundary water cooperation. Um, really what it comes down to is it's about how countries work together, how ministries within governments work together, how communities work together to make sound decisions on the development and management of their water resources within the broader context of sustainable development needs, international and regional norms, human rights, and peace and security. Um, you know, but, but there's a part of this that I really want to stress that, you know, these processes, it's more than just getting to the answer. I actually think the journey really matters. Uh, you know, it's easy when you get into these processes to focus on the goals, a division of labor, a division of resources, division of costs and benefits, getting to an agreement. Uh, but I'd argue that that journey and that process is equally, if not more important. And, and the reason is, is that if stakeholders have confidence in the process used to reach decisions, it's more likely that those decisions will be sustainable, that they'll be respected, they'll be in, embodied by the stakeholders that, that you've worked so hard to bring together, that you'll achieve better, longer lasting outcomes, and you'll reduce the likelihood that disputes could evolve into conflicts if you, if you manage that process right. Creating a collaborative, problem-solving space will lead to greater innovation, will lead to more sustainable interventions. And so for, for me, the process really matters, and that process never ends. I think the one constant uh, in the world of water is, is change. Uh, you know, the solutions that we'll have today won't be the right solutions for tomorrow. We're going to need to regularly reassess the state of our resources, future forecasts, stakeholder needs, and then reevaluate our approaches on a regular basis and perhaps chart a different path forward um, as, as, as we do that. So we're going to need agile institutional arrangements that can rapidly adapt to changing conditions. It can keep us as close as we can to that Pareto frontier and to reinforce the value of cooperation. Now, I'll give you one example. You know, large dams are a good place where, where these types of issues play out. You know, physical and natural infrastructure are gonna become increasingly important to managing the greater hydrologic extremes that we're gonna see from climate change. Uh, and if done right, you know, dams can be an important source of clean energy and an essential tool for managing water for multiple purposes. While, while providing protection from floods and droughts. You know, but at the same time, if done wrong, of course, you know, dams can have long lasting impacts on people and the environment, it can exacerbate regional tensions, it can burden countries with debt, and it may prejudice the future development options of countries by locking them into an inflexible pathway for future energy development. So these are decisions that require good data in consultations across stakers, stakeholders, across sectors, and often across borders. And so coordinated management of major infrastructure, I think, is going to be essential to managing the benefits of water at the basin level and for protecting those that live within the basin. And I think there's going to be a huge challenge that we see going forward in the 50 years as we begin to push development that can have an impact across communities and across, across borders. Um, despite these challenges, I'm actually still relatively optimistic. Uh, I, there is enough water to meet our shared needs, and, and I think this can be done. I think what we're seeing is the political will to ensure access to basic services and protect the environment and strengthen water security is growing. Uh, I believe there's a greater understanding, at least in many parts of the world, that we can achieve more by working together than by working apart. Uh, I also think that the, the, the time is coming soon where no country will be able to hide what it does on water. 
and that this will force greater transparency in the end, greater accountability, and even greater cooperation, I think, between countries in solving regional water challenges. Um, I, you know, I hate to call water a problem that needs to be solved because I don't think we're ever going to wake up one morning and say, hey, our job's done. I think sound management of water resources, access to drinking water sanitation, you know, these are going to be forever goals and uh, things that we're going to be forever working on. Uh, but, uh, but I'm hopeful that we're going to get this done all right. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Aaron, for ending on a message of hope, which is especially appropriate on the eve of the Smithsonian's Earth Optimism Summit and also looking at where we need to go moving forward. I spoke a lot about solutions earlier, and I think others did as well. So thank you also for highlighting the need for processes, especially around stakeholder engagement. Before we open the discussion to the bigger group, I'd like to ask you to speak a little bit more about that, please. How do you first identify all of the right stakeholders, figure out who needs to be at that table, come up with an equitable way to get them engaged? And then the main challenge is, of course, keeping them involved so that when it's time to act, you can take advantage of those agile institutional arrangements to call on people to play the various roles. Um, as part of a larger coordinated endeavor. Okay, there we go. Yeah, sorry, the host needs to unmute us as we come in and out, so it, it slows us down. For those who are listening, it slows us down a little bit, so apologies for that. Um, I, you know, this is almost an impossible problem, right? This is a really, really hard thing. It's the heart of most of everything that we do. Um, the you know, it's, stakeholders often are self-identified and they come forward if you create the right opportunities. They will hopefully come forward and present themselves in a the process. But in some cases, you really have to make a specific effort to go out and reach them, particularly in marginalized communities. You know, if we're dealing with um, getting specific perspectives around, around gender, around minorities, around um, uh, individuals who uh, are, are compromised in some way, shape, or form, you have to make special efforts to reach out to those groups and to bring them in. And you have to create space for them to be part of the discussion. And that's a, it's a really hard thing to do. It's an art form. And it, it's something, it's a skill set that I hope we can build more and more. I mean, it was interesting, you know, uh, Shana and the earlier panel was talking a little bit about this, which is she's a social scientist in a group of engineers. Um, how, do we, how do we work with engineers and scientists to, to, to manage processes in a way that can be more inclusive, that can, that can, where we can listen a little bit better? I mean, the challenge, of course, is that we always fear that we're not going to get to an answer that way. Right, that there's going to be so many disparate viewpoints that we're not going to be able to reconcile all these things and be able to move forward. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I share that. I think if you have an honest conversation and you really work hard with everyone to make sure they all have a common understanding of what's going on, then, then I think we can take steps um, to make progress. And I think everybody realizes that. Um, my dog is now introducing himself to the audience. Uh, so, so I think I, I think it can be done. It takes unique skill sets. I think we need to work to build that in our scientific folks and community. But I think I think we can do it. I agree. Um, I love bringing social science perspectives to bear on science and policy issues. Did any of the other panelists have a comment on stakeholder engagement or a strategy that they'd like to share before we move on to the wicked discussion of institutionalization? Just raise your hand and then we can unmute you if you'd like to speak. Yes, I thought you might, um, Aidan. Yeah, um, I don't know if I have any new wisdom, but I wanted to uh, echo several things that, they, that um, Aaron mentioned. Uh, inclusiveness keep coming to, to, to my mind. And I think that is one thing we need to do to look at all of the problems that we have. It's not one, community versus another, right? Unfortunately, we tend to react very much knee jerk to say, well, that's not my problem. I'm on the East Coast, I got plenty of water, right? And then until there's a conflict and then we can't reconcile, we don't know who is sitting across the table. I also very much appreciate what Aaron said about the process. The journey is so important. We spend, including ourselves as a company, we have lots and lots of metrics. Go get the thing done and we're so good at it. I can tell you that whether it's the quality earnings or the next thing, please your clients. 
And we cannot lose sight of the journey, I think, because that is when we build understanding, right? When you think about states, in the Western states, they, 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 they compete for water, right? And we say, well, it's not our problem and all this, and we don't understand why. I think the understanding takes, it goes a long way to help sustain the dialogue. I think, Anne, you said it earlier, or Aaron, about how do we systemize this whole dialogue and journey, right? And I think the awareness needs to be sustained. The awareness of the understanding and, and to be able to see someone else's view. And, and we, if we can continue to do that, that will actually help us get to the, uh, get to the metric, whatever we wanna go. And I wanna say one last thing, you know, I didn't, I didn't wanna spend much time giving opening remarks, but one of the things I had prepared to say, Aaron actually said it, and again, I wanna echo that. Or oh, Anne, maybe you did. So for IBM, we've been passionate about this issue for more than 50 years, right? Our first policy came up before the first Earth Day, environmental policy. But we also realized that addressing environmental challenging requires sustained action. And you know, just as if we think we've solved the problem, new challenges emerge. And I think you, one of you said that, and I want to underscore that. It really requires sustained action and some new problems come and, and new conflicts even population increase, right, cause the problem that previously weren't around to, to surface. So very good points. I want to just agree and echo that. You talk about resilience a lot. I think some of the most productive conversations I've heard in the context of COVID response, for example, are moving away from risk and risk mitigation to resilience, which is setting people up through processes as well as through solutions and innovations to not just solve one problem, but be able to solve all of the multitudes of other problems that we know are going to arise. So we have about seven minutes left and I'd like to actually devote them to discussing this challenge of sustainability. I promised that I would get back to the underwater time machines. And I was struck by this solution because it's awesome, but also because it seems almost like the Lake George example as something that could probably be limited in the degree that it scales, or perhaps not. Um, also, Aidan mentioned showing the art of the possible as one initial step towards crafting and demonstrating the value of both processes and also solutions. And then Aaron mentioned that the challenge wasn't in giving communities first time access to water resources, but crafting sustainable solutions to ensure security over time. So my question for you all is as follows. How do we take the art of the possible or these case studies or these great demonstrations or these initial achievements and institutionalize them so that these approaches can continue to be applied to new challenges as they emerge. We can start with David and the time machines as an example, if that's all right. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I think with a lot of the discussion we've had today, the critical thing is if you develop a new technology, um, in order for it to be institutionalized, I think it has to become affordable enough and easy enough to use so that it can be used by the people that need to use it all around the world. So with my underwater time machine, one of the next steps and one of the big challenges is to make it low cost and get it in the hands of local communities. Um, we were talking about the process of identifying stakeholders and one lesson we've definitely learned from marine conservation is marine conservation works best when it's done by the local communities. And I feel like we can provide scientific support and eventually if we can provide tools that the communities can use, that makes the process something that can be institutionalized and that can go on for many years to come. And I think that's the only way we're gonna have a long term, make a long term difference is really in, you know, um, provide tools that give the communities um, the resources that they need to deal with these really challenging problems. So with underwater time machine, we're definitely trying to do that. And some of the challenges are getting low cost sensors that are robust and, and stable enough to be used. Um, 
providing open access solutions so eventually communities will be able to build their own systems. But I think it could, it, the same could be said for water resources, um, for dealing with um, challenges in, in freshwater lakes. I think all of these challenges share a lot of parallels. And, um, and I think trying to simplify and put the tools out there is a critical part of that. Oh, there we go. Um, can I add to that? Can you hear me, Ann? We're good. Oh, good. Uh, maybe just a little bit more because uh, one side of this is actually, you know, bringing new technologies and enabling that to happen out in some of these places. A slightly different approach. You know, in light of, of, of COVID-19, one of the things that we're giving thought to, and um, I'm not sure the new generation will appreciate this, but people my age might, is the anarchist guide to disinfection. You know, how, how do you in low resource settings provide, you know, how can somebody build where they are um, the disinfection products that they need to disinfect surfaces, to, you know, take care of the laundry, disinfect waste, to, you know, purify their water. You know, if you're stuck in the desert island and you've only got three items, how can you take those three items and turn them into the product that you need? to protect your health in critical settings and things like that. Um, you know, th that type of innovation uh, in low resource settings is, is a lot of the stuff that we try to look at. So in addition to building some of those new technologies, uh, we wanna give a lot of thought to how we you know, specifically look at those low resource environments, what's available and commonly available, and how do we kludge those things together and, and MacGyver a new product to, that, that will actually deliver the, you know, a better outcome. It might not be the ideal and perfect outcome, but again, we're looking at progressive improvements. If I can get a one log reduction in infection rates by using a disinfection product, it might not be you know, five or six log, but, but that one log reduction will still save a ton of lives and is critically important. And so how, how we actually get, you know, again, progressively move people to better and better situations, that's what we're after. And, and how we do that in low resource settings and innovate in low resource settings, I think is a key part of that. Hey, Don, any thoughts on institutionalization? I know it's a huge challenge and you are in the process of being unmuted so you can talk about addressing it. And thank you, Aaron. Thank you, David, for sharing your thoughts. I think those are great takeaways. All right, I think I'm unmuted now, sorry. Yeah, um, thanks to both of you. You're much more creative than I am, David and Aaron to get this discussion going. And I think um, uh, the, the cost and accessibility to solution is, is definitely key. And I will come back to, to the prototype that we're doing with marine litter, right? For example, I, I mentioned earlier, the first thing we do, I mean, there's much to do to get a platform launched, okay? The first step we are demonstrating, actually, it's, uh, it's intended to show as many people as possible of what is possible, right? And by doing that, we're highlighting uh, using natural language processing capability to access information. And that goes back to David's point. You have to make it easy. And you can't, you know, scientists like yourselves know how to go access information. That's your life, right? But 99% of the people in the world want to do something. Policymakers, they don't want to be searching publications. How do we make it easy, right? And that is one way of institutionalized. Someone types in a very simple, uh, question in a natural speaking language and the interface will pick it up and, and connect the person to do, 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 do whatever. So that is an example of uh, propagating technology know-how across society. And when that happens, that becomes part of us, right? And the second thing is uh, what they, what Aaron said caused me to also uh, thought about the whole idea of you know one size fit all doesn't work right whether or not we like it we are in different places we have different access to natural resources there's wealthier countries there's less uh you know unfortunate uh, less resource uh, available places so how do we do things so everybody could get to uh, to, this is the basic needs and i think that also comes back to the example that i was thinking about what are we doing in terms of the, the providing access. Uh, if, if someone in a far flank place is able to answer a simple question the way they understand it, the way they see their world, and from there they are able to be taken 
to the knowledge warehouse or take to a technology warehouse or to pick from a list of things that they are able to implement, whether it's you know, sanitation technology or, or something else. It's all tied together is we need to develop solutions that fits the whole range of our society. To that, I think that is the way to both institutionalize or to also uh, mobilize everyone uh, to, 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 to what they can and to help them uh, get what they need to have a sustainable living. Thank you, Idan. I heard a lot of hope um, in those three answers and just want to recap two things. One of them being enabling communities and building capacity for local on the ground solutions, including through inclusive approaches, open data and open or low cost solutions for environmental monitoring, like low cost sensors. I think these are all critical to enabling action as well as data collection in the next 50 years. The second thread that I really loved is this idea of embracing partial solutions. We don't have to solve climate change in a day, although we should make significant progress on it over the next 50 years. But every time we move 1% in the right direction, that's progress. So on that note, and also recognizing that the Smithsonian's Earth Optimism Summit is around to continue this discussion, I'd like to thank all three of you for contributing to this panel, as well as everybody who shared their thoughts and expertise earlier on. I'd like to thank all of the programs across the Wilson Center that co-sponsored this event, the Science and Technology Innovation Program, China Environment Forum, Latin America, Polar Institute, Environmental Change and Security, and other collaborators as well. And then end with a personal um, call to action for helping get to that 1%. So as Congresswoman Harmon mentioned in her introductions, the Wilson Center is proud to be a partner along with the Earth Day Network U.S. Department of State through the Eco Capitals Forum and many others on Earth Challenge 2020, which we are launching as what we hope will evolve into the largest coordinated citizen science initiative to date. And to further introduce this project and issue a call to action, we will close with a video by Dennis Hayes, who was there for the first Earth Day, marching in the streets and continues to work with us through Earth Day Network today. So thank you once again, and enjoy Dennis. Hi, I'm Dennis Hayes. I was the national coordinator of the first Earth Day back in 1970. 50 years ago, 20 million people protested the damage to our Earth, and over the subsequent five decades, a lot has happened. The ozone layer is healing, renewable energy now is booming, Environmental awareness around the planet has never been higher. But some risks are more acute than before. Climate change, loss of species, plastic pollution. Today, we humans have the technology, the finance, and the numbers to destroy life itself, or to act and save ourselves. Country, community, and company leaders need to take the best choices right now. To do that, they need the best science, and you can help. In recognition of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the Earth Day Network, the Wilson Center, and the U.S. Department of State are launching Earth Challenge 2020 as the biggest ever coordinated citizen science initiative, aimed at helping all of us get a better snapshot of what's happening to the Earth. Your passion, the power of your smartphone, and Earth Challenge 2020 app is all you need. Join Earth Challenge and make the difference on Earth Day 2020.